It's interesting that the ancient church, the one closest to the teachings of the apostles, in response to heresy, would not say, oh, you know, well, let's just, you know, show them we're Christians by our love. They doubled down on the traditions of the church. Going back to the initial reason of Advent, the first Advent, preparing for Christmas. Now, something that, a little bit of history, a little bit of back backstory with um, Advent, like many traditions within the church, we don't have a specific date on when Advent started, but we do have a council in 380 AD that mentions Advent. It mentions that Advent has been going on for a while. It's the Council of Sargosa, mm-hmm. which when I first learned about this in seminary, it sounded like you know, a Pirates of the Caribbean thing, the Council of Sargosa. <laughs> and <laughs> Sargosa is in modern-day Spain, for anyone who doesn't know. But the Council of Sargosa in 380 AD was um, fighting against the Priscillian heresy. So Priscillianism is basically a, a pseudo-Gnostic heresy that basically basically said that the incarnation of Christ was not meant to redeem human nature. It is not good that Christ was incarnate. And because they were very anti-physical, they ended up denying the incarnation. And we know that, you know, what the Apostle John says in 1 John, that anyone who denies that Christ has come in the flesh is antichrist. So what the Council of Sargosa mm-hmm. does in order to combat um, Priscillianism in their churches is to say, look, we need to double down on Advent. Like, we've already been celebrating Advent for a while now, but we got to tell our churches to double down. We've got to make sure that everybody's coming on the Sundays in Advent. we got to make sure we have extra days during during the week. So they were really the first pioneers of the Advent midweek service. And they really emphasize the ember days mm-hmm. in Advent because their reasoning behind this is to ah, say yes. that, yeah, their reasoning behind this is to say if the if the Priscillians are going to deny the incarnation, we need to prepare to celebrate the incarnation even more so because that incarnation is what really you know the the culmination of all of the waiting of the Old Testament saints comes, I mean, God himself is joining a human nature to himself, and so to deny something like that in the early church is is going to cause a lot of people, again, to double down on this season of Advent, to say, we have to prepare because the incarnation is that important. It does redeem human nature. Jesus does take on human mm-hmm. flesh. He is fully God and fully man, and so you know, Advent 380 AD, that's, that's pretty early for a, for a season in the church as far as dates go, but it was celebrated even before the Council of Sargosa. The Council of Sargosa is just doubling down on it because these, these Gnostics are still wanting to deny the incarnation. And so we got to prepare for the incarnation even more. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that the ancient church, the one closest to the teachings of the apostles, in response to heresy, would not say, oh, you know, well, let's just, you know, show them we're Christians by our love. They doubled down on the traditions of the church as a response to heresy, and they used the liturgy as a defense, as a bulwark against that heresy. It's it's fascinating. You know, we all want to be that ancient Book of Acts church. Get ye to liturgy then. Drop your silly little coo. I mean, you want to talk about a tradition of man. That is definitely a tradition of man. And get, get back to a liturgical way of doing things because the liturgy is so robust with the Word of God, heresy cannot stand where the liturgy is. Exactly. I mean, it, and it goes back even to the traditions within the synagogue and within the temple. You know, liturgy has been a part of God's, God's framework from, from the very beginning. Uh, to deny that mm-hmm. what we have today in the liturgy is, you know, and I, I grew up, I grew up Pentecostal, so the idea that 
there would be mm-hmm. an, an order of service or a liturgy is just it's it to them it, it's 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 um hampering the holy spirit it's like uh, closing him in he can't do anything in a liturgy mm-hmm. and it's like that's denying the power of the word of god the effic- the efficacy of the word of god in the liturgy and it's also denying how the church has <clears throat> always done church it's denying the fact that we are by nature traditional we may not realize it but every single church has a liturgy whether it's defined or not even the most low pentecostal churches have a liturgy you know they may they start out with some praise mm-hmm. songs you know they they take up an offering they'll say a prayer over the offering some more praise songs then a sermon then some closing praise songs it's mostly just a concert with some, you know, inspirational stuff thrown in yeah. there, but it's still yeah. a liturgy. It's still a tradition. It's it's fascinating that the the historic liturgy of the church and heaven forbid assigned readings oh. would put God the Holy Spirit in a box. So by saying the word of God, the God the Holy Spirit can't use the word of God to convict the hearts of man. That's not putting God in a box. Exactly. Yeah. You're you're doing the actual thing that you're accusing people of doing. Where the word is taught in spirit and truth, there the Holy Spirit is. And the promise of the word of God that it will not return to him without having accomplished that for which it was sent. 